Okay. Uh, Peter? Peter, can you hear me? Eh, no se oye. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I think we can start, right? Okay. So, hello, Peter. <laughs> we are Nerea and Alejandro, two of the organizers of TechFest, the, the first event on technology and computer science of the University Carlos III of Madrid. And we have uh, here people that want to, to hear your presentation, so as soon as my, my mate introduce you, we, do, we can start. Okay, I don't think it's really necessary to introduce you because most people here know you, uh, but let me introduce you anyway, right? Uh, Peter Norvig is Director of Research of Google. He's also co-author of uh, Introduct uh, Artificial Intelligence, a Modern Approach, one of the most uh, relevant textbooks in the field of artificial intelligence. And he, along with Sebastian Thran, ran last year a massive online open course of uh, introduction to artificial in intelligence. And with all that said, Peter, the stage is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, great to uh, be here and have the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today was a, a way of trying to understand the world uh, by uh, looking at models of the world and looking at data and trying to understand things better to see how far we can go with that. Now here's the uh, traditional scientific method is that uh, we have a scientist and uh, he or she observes the world and then uh, gets an idea and comes up with some kind of a theory and then from that theory, you can uh, start to do things, like here, uh, planning the orbit of a spaceship. And that all follows very neatly uh, from the mathematics. And in fact, uh, Eugene Wigner, who's a Nobel Prize winning physicist, from whom I borrowed the title in this talk, uh, talked about how amazing it is that mathematics works so well for such a variety of things, that these simple laws, like F equals MA or E equals MC squared can explain so much about the world. Now, I think he said that because he was a physicist. If he were a biologist, he wouldn't be saying that the world is uh, so neat and fits into small equations. And he certainly wouldn't be saying that if he was a sociologist and had to deal with uh, messy things like people. So the question for the rest of us who aren't physicists is uh, how far can we go? Uh, we can't have simple models, can we have models that are appropriate to the rest of the world? Now, uh, here's another guy, George Box, a statistician, who reminds us that essentially all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. So I think the, uh, the scientific quest should not be just, can we come up with the perfect model, like E equals MC squared, can we do something useful? Can we make predictions in the world? Can we get something right? Can we improve? So I'm going to look at two classes of uh, uh, models. We're going to look at texts and images. These are the, the types of data that uh, people like uh, Google have access to and have been able to uh, build models by having lots of data. And here's an example. Uh, I don't know how uh, easy it is for you to see this, but this is a tool that Google has provided uh, in which we have taken the text from uh, millions of books that have been published over the years and allow you to search over those books for phrases and see how popular they are. And here I've used this to uh, do some research into history. So I'm taking a, uh, a field that isn't normally associated with quantitative data, the field of history, and trying to solve it uh, just by looking at this data. And it may be hard for you to read, but what I have here is I've looked for the frequency of two phrases, the United States is and the United States are. And what I'm trying to do here is answer the question, does the United States think of itself as a federation of different states, or does it think of itself as one union? And we can see uh, the two lines there. The blue line is the United States is, and the red line is the United States are. And we can see that uh, right up until the Civil War, 
the United States are was more popular, and then after that, uh, the United States is became more popular. So we can see the events of history reflected in the counts of statistics of words. So that was one example. And that was it done just by our work of uh, basically counting the number of words. Uh, so not much, but if you're clever in what you think about, you can come up with good answers. Now I'm going to switch to a uh, possibly a harder problem. This is the problem of text segmentation. Now, in languages like Chinese, uh, there are no spaces between words, so in order for me to read this, I have to just figure out, uh, is the first word, is that one character, or two characters, or what? Uh, but since uh, you may not speak Chinese, and, and I definitely don't, uh, let's switch the task to English, and let's pretend English was written that way, without spaces between the words. And if you saw a phrase like this, uh, it's not too hard to be able to make sense of it, to figure out where the words are. Now the question is, how can you do that? And if I need to know everything about what these words mean, and how they're related to each other, and what the grammar of the sentence is, then it's going to be hard to do it. But if I can come up with a model that's much simpler, that, but still allows me to solve this task, uh, then I'm going to be happy. I can do something with that task. So, how do I create a model? Well, I need some data. So here's some data. I just go out and collect uh, text from books or off the internet. And then I'm going to summarize this data. And I'm going to do that by uh, imagining this as a piece of paper and taking out my scissors and uh, cutting up each individual word. And then I throw all the slips of paper into a bag. We call it the bag of words model. Not, not very imaginative. And then I start reaching into the bag and pulling out uh, words. And maybe uh, the word the is common, and I pull that out 14% of the time, and there are other words that are less common. And my model of language, this very simplified model, becomes language is the sequence of words that you pull out when you just reach into the bag. Now, I know that model is wrong. Uh, that uh, That's saying that uh, it doesn't matter what word came before, every, every word is random. But maybe the model is useful, even though it's wrong. Now, I can put some mathematics behind that. And here I'm just uh, writing formulas for what I just said, that the probability of a sequence of words uh, is the formed by multiplying together the probability of the individual words. And the probability of the individual words you get by estimating from the data the number of slips of paper in the bag. Now, I can, using that model, I can solve for this problem of best segmentation. And here it gets a little bit trickier. So I have this uh, segment of T, which is going to, I'm going to define a formula for the best segmentation. And T is a text, which can be broken up into a first word and the rest of the words. And what I'm saying is the best segmentation is the best way of breaking it up into the first word and the rest words such that I maximize the probability of the first word followed by the rest of the words. So that's all this formula says. It's kind of the definition of what it means by uh, uh, segmentation. And here's an example of applying that. So I have this uh, segment of text, uh, N-O-W-I-S-T-H-E-T-I-M-E, -E and so on. And the first word could be just an N, or it could be an N-O, or it could be N-O-W, and so on. And by seeing how common each of those uh, uh, words are in the text, I have a probability of the first word, and then I can figure out the probability of the rest of the word by the formula. And we see NO and NOW are very common English words, they're about a quarter of a percent each. N and NOWI, not nearly as common. And it turns out that the uh, most probable by a wide margin, by a factor of uh, uh, 100,000 times more probable, is in fact the exact correct segmentation. So I didn't have to know anything about the meanings of the words. I just had to know how probable they were, and I got this right. So how often does this work right? Uh, I should say here that uh, I showed the model first in mathematics. Here I'm showing it in a programming language, and this is the whole program. This is all you need that's on one slide. I won't go into the details. I was able to get 98% accuracy with this model. Here's some examples. See if you can do better. 
So uh, take this text and can you break that up into words? And my model got uh, base rate sought to, and the correct answer was base rates ought to. And those are both both pretty good uh, interpretations, but it just happens that one was wrong. Here's another one. My model got small and insignificant, but it should have got small and insignificant. And here's a case where the simplifications I made in my model uh, came back uh, to give me an error. In my model, all the words are independent of each other. So I'm looking for how common is the word small, how common is the word in, how small, common is the word significant. And what my model doesn't know, that the word insignificant goes better with the word small, and the word significant does not go as well. So if I had a more sophisticated model that looked not at each word individually, but looked at the neighboring words, then I could have gotten this one right. Here's one more, a harder one. See if you can break that up into words. My model came up with G in or mouse go, and the correct answer was ginormous ego. And the reason I got that wrong is because I trained my model with a lot of text. I gave it four billion words of text. Uh, but in all those four billion words, it had never seen ginormous before, and so it didn't get that one right. So 98% accuracy is pretty good for a couple lines of equations, but not perfect. Here's a much more sophisticated example of what we've been able to do at Google using similar techniques, basically just counting words. Uh, we've built a machine translation system, and here you see input in German and output in English, uh, and it does a pretty good job. Now, how do we do that? Well, we do it pretty much the same way as I talked about with uh, cutting up the sheet of paper and putting it into a bag. So we scour the World Wide Web, and we find examples of document pairs where there's one document in English and one in German, and there's a link that says this is a translation of the other. We don't get just one document, we get millions of them, and from that, we have a, uh, a set of pairs of translations. And here's a set of pairs that I got when I was traveling to a hotel in Berlin. They had a brochure in the hotel, and on the left-hand side was English, and the right-hand side was German. So if I collected that data, now somebody asked me exactly one of those sentences in English, I could translate them into German. I could do that without even knowing anything. But of course, I'm not likely to be asked exactly what are the sentences I've seen before, but I might be asked about words and phrases I've seen before. So to make a good model, I've got to break up these large boxes of sentence-to-sentence -sentence translations or page-to-page -page translations and break them down into phrase for phrase. In fact, we can do that. So there's a simple procedure for going through and saying, this phrase occurs a lot when it's aligned up with this one, so that must fit. And once that fits, and then we can figure out how the others fit. It's like doing a jigsaw puzzle, where if one piece fits in, and then there's fewer pieces left, and eventually you have it all worked out. So we have the alignments here of how often each phrase in English lines up with a phrase in German. And so now, uh, we, we have that model of translation. We also, we keep along the model of the target language for translating into English. We keep that bag of words for English. In fact, we keep a bag of phrases to say how common is each English phrase. And then uh, another thing with translation is you gotta get the order of the words right. So not only do you have to know which phrase corresponds to which other phrase, but also in different languages they may be moved around. Uh, in English, we usually have the subject at the beginning of the sentence, in German, it's often uh, nearer the end of the sentence. And so we have another model that says, for each phrase, how often, how likely is it to be shifted to the right or to the left? And so we can build those three models mechanically from text without having to understand what any of the words or phrases mean. And now we have the decoding process where we're uh, given a source sentence, say we're translating from German to English, so we're given the sentence, uh, Guten Tag, clever student. And then we want to break it into phrases that we've already seen before. Say we've seen the phrases, Guten Tag, and clever student. And then we pick a translation for each phrase, good afternoon, clever students. 
And then we, uh, we look at our probabilities for moving the phrases to the right or the left. How often does the phrase, uh, good afternoon, move to the right or move to the left and decide if we want to shuffle them around. Here I've chosen not to do that. And the translation I get out is good afternoon, clever students. Now that all worked out right, uh, but in reality what we do is we try lots of options. So I chose uh, one translation for each of the phrases. In reality, we choose lots of different possibilities. We give each one a probability score and choose the most probable. And basically that's it. That's all there is to Google Translate. Of course, there's hundreds of little tricks, but that's the whole idea, is uh, doing counts of word phrases and then maximizing probability. Uh, and that's the formal model. I won't go into the details of that. Instead, I want to move along from text to now talk about images. Now, when we uh, try to recognize the uh, parts of images, uh, there's two ways to do that. One is uh, we can be very clever with uh, programmers, or we could try to learn from the data. And both approaches have been taken. So you could probably uh, you have or you can buy now a camera that can recognize faces. You uh, point your camera at someone and it puts a little box around the face of anybody that it recognizes. And mostly those are done by a programmer saying, uh, what do faces look like? Well, they've got uh, two blobs that look like eyes and so on and so on. The programmer writes down everything they know about faces. And that's great uh, if you want the camera to do one thing, recognize faces. But if you want it to recognize thousands of different objects, you'd probably rather learn that uh, rather than having to program every one. And going back to 1996, uh, there was a proposal for trying to do that. So the idea was, I want to learn uh, what are all the objects in, uh, in a picture. And the way I'm going to try to do that is by saying, how can I represent what a what a picture is made out of. What are the key objects that all pictures are made out of? And then I want to uh, have each picture be the summation of those objects. So this object is uh, a face with a tree in the background and a sky up above. So it's the summation of a little bit of face, a little bit of tree, a little bit of sky. So here we have a summation of a sub i is a, a parameter that says how much of each of these pieces and the f sub i is the pieces that we're combining to make a picture. And the pieces uh, have a little bit at every x, y position. So the, the picture is made out of pixels at x, y positions, and we're adding up these little pieces. So, so we're saying, how can we break a picture into pieces that we know what each piece is, and then assemble it back together again? And the hope was that by uh, looking at lots of data of different pictures, we could figure out what are the best pieces. We wouldn't have to say, I want the pieces to be a face with eyes. The system would figure it out for itself. So it's unsupervised. We don't have to tell it what each piece is. Uh, we don't tell it anything about what the world is made out of. All we say is uh, pixels are near each other. And so basically we're taking a collection of pictures and we're trying to figure out uh, what objects are those pictures made out of. And the hope was that this would scale up. And here's what happens when you apply that uh, technique from 1996, is these are the objects that come back. And essentially what it's saying is pictures are made out of little lines. And you can see each of these individual squares is a little line in a certain spot in a certain orientation. Uh, and that makes sense. Uh, you know, so if you think of how do you make a picture, if I give you a, uh, a pencil, well, you draw a picture by making lots of little lines. Uh, so yes, that covers how you make pictures, but it's not very interesting to say, all I've got is lines. So the next step was to say, let's have a model that's like that, but it doesn't go directly from, uh, from the pixels to a picture, rather it goes in multiple steps. It says, let's take individual lines, and they're connected into corners, and then those are connected into bigger blobs, and those are connected into bigger ones. And if we do that, does it, something interesting come out? And it took 10 years or so for the field to make progress on that. Uh, but this time, uh, now it's starting to uh, get some results. Uh, starting in 2006, some recent results in 2009 that started to be very impressive. And here's just a diagram of, of 
of what the processing looks like at uh, feeding up to higher levels. And here are the pieces that come out. Uh, and I, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but it's starting to get a lot more interesting. Now, instead of just getting, uh, saying that a picture is made out of lines, you throw a lot of pictures at the system and it comes back. And when you show it pictures of faces, here we have two levels. At the bottom, it recognizes that faces were an important part of that. At the top is a smaller levels that the faces are made out of. And you can see that it's figuring out that there are eyes and noses and ears. So it's figured out that those are important parts of the pictures. And similarly on the right, you show it lots of cars, it figures out that there are cars, and it figures out that there are tires and doors. So we've gotten this uh, hierarchical capability to break objects into pieces for the first time starting in 2009. Here's other examples with chairs, and it works uh, if you combine lots of different objects together, it kind of optimally divides up the amount of pieces it was allowed to have to represent all those objects at once. We thought this was very exciting, and we were able to assemble a team at Google to work on this. So we had uh, Andrew Ng, who was behind this uh, 2009 paper, Jeff Hinton, who had been doing this going back e even to the 80s when I was in graduate school, and in a lot of the resurgence in the late 90s. Uh, and Jeff Dean, uh, already a Googler, and Jeff Dean is a guy where if you've got a program that works pretty well on a computer that looks like this, and you want it to run on a computer that looks like this, a, a data center the size of a, of a city block, uh, well, Jeff Dean is the guy that we call. So we had these experts in mathematics and image processing, and we have experts in large data processing. We put them together to see if we can make progress on this problem. And here's the, the rough idea of the uh, size uh, of the computer that we're dealing with. So 16,000 CPUs on 1,000 different servers, and we're able to build a model with a billion parameters. So about 100 times larger than anything that had been done before. Uh, and we were hoping that by just applying more computing power and being clever, we'd get better results. So we trained it on YouTube videos. We gave it, uh, we chose 10 million YouTube videos. And for the, the first uh, trial, we didn't give them the whole video, but we just chose one frame from each of the videos. So that's a representation of the world. And here's what comes out. Uh, and uh, I don't know how easy that is for you to see, but on the left uh, is one of the categories it's picked out. And if you have YouTube videos in, that it's inevitable that cats will come out. So the system has recognized, without us telling it anything about what objects are in the videos, it's recognized that cats are an important part. It's, it's uh, pulled those out as components, and it's recognized that faces are an important part. And then you can ask it to say, okay, uh, part of your representation is cats. It didn't, it didn't have the word cats, but it just inside of it, there's one of the pieces it's allowed to make was this piece that uh, recognizes cats, and we can ask it what's the most likely cat and what's the most likely base, and this is what it comes up with. So it's able to reproduce this idea of an ideal cat just by seeing lots of examples. It didn't, we didn't have to tell it what was what, it still came up with that. Here are some other examples of what it can do. Uh, so some of the types of objects it represents, some of the uh, components are just like textures, like round dots. Uh, some of them are shapes, like diagonal lines going from right to left or left to right, or circles. Uh, and some of them are objects, like yellow flowers, or uh, ducks, or zebras, or uh, computer keypads, or wine bottles, or pizzas. It's able to recognize all these objects and pull them out from uh, so that's pretty exciting to us. It seems very promising for object recognition. We've applied the same technology with this large uh, 16,000 uh, computer processing system to other problems. We applied it to the problem of speech recognition, like we have in the Android phone, and we're able to get a, about a 20% improvement in accuracy just by using this new model that's more accurate and breaking down the world. So uh, to wrap up, uh, 
When I was in uh, school learning computer science, they, uh, they always gave me a picture that looks like this. That says, here's what computer science is. There's a program in the middle, and it has some input, it produces some output, it takes some data, and it runs on some hardware. But really, the important stuff is the program in the middle, and that's what computer science is going to be about. It's about programming, programming languages, programming algorithms. Uh, all the focus is on the middle. But in recent years, some of the focus has shifted to the top to say it's hard work to produce programs. And maybe if we're able to collect more data, we can do less work on the programs and more work on processing the data uh, in a clever way. And we find that a lot of the problems we see at Google follows this pattern of a data threshold. And so here, schematically, I have uh, along the bottom axis the amount of data you have from tens of examples up to billions of examples. And in the axis going up is the quality of your solution. And we find for many types of problems, there's this threshold where you come up with a model, come up with an algorithm, it doesn't perform very well, but if you add more data, it reaches a point where it starts to do very well, like we saw with machine translation. And so uh, one of the approaches or the strategies we have is say, let's look for problems that have this, this kind of shape and then just collect more data so that we pass that threshold and we start getting good performance. And I can say, uh, you know, another way of looking at it is that we're changing computing from being a mathematical science. The traditional models of computing is you have a specification of what you want to get done, you write a program, you can do some formal proof of correctness to say this program does what it's supposed to do, and that's what programming is. It works very well for uh, problem domains that you can specify completely clearly. The, uh, if you want to add up a column of numbers, there's one de definitive answer. If you want to write bank software, you know if uh, money is transferred from one account to another account that the total amount of money is conserved. And you can prove those properties correct. But for many of these other types of problems that we're dealing with, like machine translation or recognizing objects and images, there is no one absolutely correct answer. So now we're seeing computing more like a natural science. There's no clear specification. There's uncertainty about the world. There's uncertainty about the objective to what the right answer is. So instead of proving your answer is correct, you hypothesize, you come up with experiments, you run these experiments over large amounts of data, and then you analyze, iterate, and, and improve. And I think that's a different way of thinking about the world, thinking about what computers can do, and thinking about how they can solve problems. That's what I wanted to talk about today, and I'm happy to answer questions from you. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, okay, fine. Um, thank you, Peter, for your presentation. And I may be wondering, uh, we have still like some minutes, uh, so maybe you uh, might accept some questions from the audience? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so I really encourage you to ask any question you have to Peter Norby. <laughs> Okay, we have a question so far. Okay, how did you come up with the idea to provide such an artificial intelligence program to actually do that? I mean, I was very impressed when I saw the perfect cat or the perfect man. How do you actually come up with a program like that? I mean, it has to be, I don't know. For me, it seems really hard to actually not come up with the idea, but actually come up with the work to be able to program a computer to find such a thing like that. How did you uh, program the schedule and how did you actually go through all the operations to, res to obtain that result? Okay, so that's a great question. Uh, uh, hard to answer simply. And I mean, one thing to say is, uh, you know, we did a small bit uh, that's in a succession of work done over decades, right? 
So I, I mentioned uh, a couple famous papers. Uh, uh, it started to get really interesting in 2009, but it was really the start of this line of work was in 1996. So people have been working on this for, uh, you know, for 20 years or so. And, uh, and you know, people try out lots of different ideas and, and people contribute little bits. Uh, so it's not like uh, we had to be clever all at once. Uh, I don't think anybody's smart enough to sit down and from nothing to have come up with what we did. I think uh, rather it's people working a little bit at a time. So what were we, what were we able to do that was new? Um, so it's a couple of things. One is we said, uh, well, maybe it's just a question of can we scale up? Can, these, can this type of approach work better if uh, we just have more computing power than anybody has before. And we knew that we were in a position where we had the amount of computers, we had the amount of input of uh, images or videos that uh, other people didn't have access to. And we had a bunch of engineers and programmers who were used to dealing at that scale. So we thought we had a unique opportunity to scale that up. Now, why do we think that would help? Well, the best inspiration we have for trying to understand how to do these types of things is uh, the human visual system. And, and we looked at some of the research, we had some people internally who have a background uh, uh, in uh, human biology as, as well as in computer science. And we understood a little bit about how the human visual system works, uh, about how many neurons there are and so, and so on. And we said, yes, it seems like uh, you know, humans are applying more processing power than the uh, simpler computer models. So it seems like it could help to scale those models up. And we took some uh, very specific ideas about how things work. Uh, so you know, we don't know everything about how the brain works and how the brain is connected to the eye, but we know some uh, of the simple things. And we just made some choices about what is it that we want to try to represent? What is it about the way uh, we look at a picture that we want to try to make sense of that? Uh, and I can't go into all the details for that, uh, but example, one of the things that we did uh, that improved things that not everyone had tried in the past was looking more at uh, differences rather than absolute values. So the human eye is very good at uh, if you go into a dark room, you can still see. If you go into, uh, out into the bright outside, you can still see. So the eye uh, detects uh, how uh, bright the overall brightness is and accommodates that. It's not looking just for one brightness level, it's looking for a relative brightness level. Same thing with colors. If there's a, a cast of a different colored uh, light bulb, the sun is one color, uh, a fluorescent light is another color, an incandescent light is another color, uh, the eye is very good at not being bothered by that, still recovering, uh, still figuring out what color is what. And so we use some of those ideas from biology to say, can we have a mathematical model that will fit that? We use some of the ideas from running data centers to say, how can we do this all efficiently and move the data around between multiple machines? Uh, and then we just started to experiment and follow up on experiments like people have been doing for decades. We were able to do just a little bit better than had been done before. Okay. Um. Okay, so next question. Hi. Um, for what I've seen, it seems that it's very easy for you nowadays to detect um, individual items, individual objects. I've been wondering if, if you have moved forward to the next step, that it's naturally for me uh, to classify general scenes, um, general environments with different objects and even classify the objects within that scene. Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, you do want to do that. I mean, we know that people identify things uh, in context. Uh, you know, if it's a, uh, a city scene, you're expecting one kind of thing. If it's in the mountains, you're expecting another thing. If it's underwater, you're expecting a different thing. Uh, and we can do some of that. So we have some of these types of correlations. Uh, and it, it depends on what kind of a model you want to build. Right? 
topic. So I, you know, I mentioned the, the simplest of word models treated every word individually and, and didn't expect the words to appear in a context. But the more you put in models of the context, uh, the better you can do. Uh, but then it means you need more data because you, instead of having the number of individual objects, uh, you know, maybe you want to break out 10,000 categories or 100,000 categories. Uh, uh, that's a reasonable number, but the number of pairs of objects now it's 10,000 squared or 100,000 squared. So uh, you you couldn't do all of those. Uh, so we have to be clever about how much uh, context you want to take into account. Uh, but we're certainly starting to do that. Uh, and you know I showed some of the categories that were very concrete, uh, like cat and face and so on. Uh, we can also come up with categories that are, are more uh, uh, sort of scene specific rather than object specific. So like uh, we have lots of pictures of uh, sunsets which you, which are detected not just because there's a sun object in the picture but because there's an overall color cast to the, to the whole picture. There's sort of a style of sunset pictures. So we have those types of things. I think the other thing that, that's uh, very important to get that we're really just getting started on is uh, sequences over time. So yes, you can look at an individual uh, picture and say these are the objects in them, but we also want to be able to look at a video and say this is walking, this is running, this is uh, eating or, or whatever action. So be able to get the verbs as well as the nouns. Uh, and uh, it's similar types of techniques, uh, but uh, uh, more details to work through. Any okay. question? Yeah. We have another question. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Thank you. Um, I would like to know, because you talked a lot of the applications and examples that are using a big set of training data. Um, so I would like to know if Google is currently working on some applications more focused on non, like on supervised learning and what kind of applications you're trying to develop and how you overcome the lack of data to develop more learning techniques. Yeah, so, it's, so it's, we certainly use uh, learning uh, everywhere throughout Google. Uh, and you talked about this distinction between supervised or unsupervised for the rest of the audience, what, what that means is, uh, do you have the answer or not? So supervised learning is when a teacher tells you, uh, here's the question and here's the answer. Now remember those and uh, generalize them so that next time when I ask you a question you haven't seen before, you can still come up with an answer by looking at similar questions. Unsupervised learning is what we were doing with the pictures. Uh, where we weren't saying, hey, this is a picture of a cat. We're just saying, these are a lot of pictures. Now you figure out uh, what's in them. Uh, a lot of the work that we do is uh, unsupervised uh, because it's hard to get a teacher to tell you the right answer to everything. But it's easy to just observe the world. If we get lots of web pages, we can't get a teacher to say, here's what's what within that web page. Uh, but there are certain places where we, where we do get that type of feedback. Uh, so for example, uh, and, and uh, we, it's rare for us to get exactly correct feedback, but it's common for us to get some feedback. So uh, we, do, we do everything we do, you do a search, we show you some web pages, and then you click on a result. And in a way, you're now serving as a teacher. You're saying, uh, for my search, looking at these results, uh, this was the right answer. Uh, now, you're not a perfect teacher because uh, sometimes you make a mistake and you click on the wrong thing, or sometimes maybe the first result was exactly the right answer, uh, but you'd already seen that page before, and so you didn't bother clicking on it, and you clicked on the second page instead. So we can't trust what this feedback we're getting from the teachers completely, uh, but we do use it. And so we have, uh, you know, across everything we do in, in uh, speech recognition, in object recognition, in uh, language learning, in uh, trying to understand what events are next, you know, what, uh, what email are you going to read, which ones are you going to classify as spam. Uh, we're trying to learn all those things, and we use a combination of these unsupervised clustering and the supervised feedback that we get from interaction with you. 
Okay, uh, there is any other yeah. question? Any other question? Yeah, okay, another one. Okay, another question there. <laughs> Hi, I'm wondering what is the relationship of uh, human computation to your work? If you have uh, thought about uh, combining the results of your work, this means artificial intelligence, with uh, human computation or crowdsourcing in general? Yeah, uh, so I, I think that's a great topic. So we, you know, we want to solve problems and we're engineers, we want to do it in a practical way. And if if we can program a solution, great. Uh, but if we can't, we're not too proud to say, uh, can we ask a human to solve this problem for us? Uh, and in many ways, uh, a lot of what we do already uses human computation. Uh, so, uh, you know, all these models that were built from web pages, well, the web pages were all authored by a human. And so we're relying on that, on that human work to do our work. Now, the, the humans didn't know they were helping us uh, do something when they wrote the pages, they did that for, for their own benefit, uh, but it's still feedback that's useful to us. Uh, some of the feedback we gather is specific, where we are asking people directly to do work for us. So we do things like, uh, in the machine translation, uh, there's a button that you can click to say, hey, this isn't good. And, uh, and there's two parts to it. One is you can just point at a translation and say, uh, I didn't get it, there's something wrong with this, it's not grammatical, it's not a good translation. Uh, or second, you could actually volunteer a better translation. And so we do uh, use that and gather that information. We have to be a little bit careful. We don't want to be uh, uh, spammed with the wrong translation, so we don't believe everything that's told to us. Uh, but we do look for opportunities to say, uh, how can we combine uh, what computers can do well with what humans can do well? And can we figure out a way that, uh, that there's a, a sort of a viable marketplace for this human work? Uh, we want to do it in a, in a way that is uh, helpful both to the human and to us. That's worth it to them to do a little bit of work because it helps us make us, makes our service better and it should be an immediate benefit to them. They do a little bit of work and they get a better result of some kind. And, uh, and when we can figure out the ways to make that happen, uh, then it's great to, to combine what computers do well with what people do well. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I think we are running out of time, so maybe we must close the questions here. I don't know whether there are more questions from the audience, but unfortunately we have no more time. So, Peter, we are really happy to have uh, your talk and to listen to you. And, well, I send you a big hug from, from this university <laughs> and from Spain, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.